now I have a great honor to present our change maker of the year. And um, this is a, a really cool award that we have for someone who's very special and doing something innovative in our community. So um, I want to introduce Marcia, Marcia Elinick, and she's been named the number, the, our 2023 change maker of the year by Marble Seed. Marcia is a descendant of the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And she's the founder of Bear Grease Botanicals, a naturopathic store that sells medicine made with foraged plants and herbs, which I think is just so cool. Um, <clears throat> Marcia also is a dog musher and she makes her own maple syrup. <coughs> Excuse me. In 2020, Marcia started Bear Grease Botanicals with only a few teas and one tincture and sold it to her own people on the Grand Portage Reservation. The next year, she branched out and sold in Grand Marais to the tourists and some locals who stopped by too. By the summer of 2022, Marcia was selling at the American Indian Community Housing Organization's Indigenous Food and Art Market. Currently, Marcia is settling into her role as Agricultural Division Director for Fond du Lac. It is a demanding role that she's been working towards for so many years. But more importantly, it is work that she loves and respects and has passion for, like we all do as farmers. Marcia, congratulations. And will you come up? We have the honor of giving Marcia this beautiful handmade pottery. Congratulations. Why don't you pick this up your left hand? That's some of our traditional same I'd like to give you. Thank you. I don't know if that's fun. Bonjour, uh, miigwech for that warm welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. There's a, there's a lot of you, uh, bear with me. I got a C minus in speech class nine years ago. Uh, after this speech, I'd like him to review my grade and, and boost that up. Um, I miigwech to Marble Seed for holding this uh, wonderful event and awarding me change maker of the year, recognizing my, my work in wild plants food and medicine. Um, it's an honor I don't take lightly. Um, I didn't really think anyone was paying attention to what I was doing. There's a lot of big name, uh, indigenous, powerful women out there um, who I follow and admire, who are doing much greater things than I am. So this is quite an honor to be here. Um, miigwech to Jason Maloney from Ag Review. Uh, for interviewing me last summer at the ECO um, Indigenous BIPOC Food and Art Market in Duluth. Um, he wrote a fantastic article about me. It was very respectful and nice. Um, and that's how Marble Seed uh, heard about me. Um, Miigwech to Patagonia for, for being a major sponsor at this event. And they sent me some fabulous uh, hemp clothing that was super comfortable. I was modeling it for my husband before we came. <laughs> um, and and miigwech to all the sponsors for, for holding such a wonderful space and, and creating this event. Um, miigwech to my oldest son, Spencer. He's home uh, caring for the seedlings in our grow room. He's caring for my sled dogs uh, and caring for our home so that we could be away for these few days. And a great big team of which to my husband, Jason. Pause for emotion. <clears throat> um, he's the love of my life, uh, my partner in absolutely everything. Um, for the last 20 years, uh, my biggest fan and biggest supporter. Um, 
my journey to get to this stage started long before I met him. Um, but I wouldn't have made it this far without his unending and absolute unconditional love, support, and constant encouragement. Instead of talking a lot about Bear Grease Botanicals today, um, I want to talk about how I came to be in this place today uh, and my journey. Um, you won't really find a, a lot of information about my company. I do have a website. I've not worked on it because I am not ready to mail out my prized medicines just yet. I'm working on the logistics. I like to feel connected to those that I'm talking about medicines and plants to. Um, so I haven't quite reached a, a place where I'm comfortable doing that yet. Um, I do have a Facebook page where you'll find plenty of pretty pictures of plants and and me out and about doing wonderful things in the woods. Um, so yeah, I just wanna tell a little bit about my story and my, and my journey here. Uh, so I grew up on a family farm. Um, that is my non-native side of the family. Um, I, I was young. I don't know a lot about how much land we had or, or any of that, but I remember a couple of milking cows, uh, chickens, uh, I remember the compost pile, and that was also the pile when my grandpa took me fishing, he dug the worms out of that pile. It was thriving. Um, there was big garden, gardens, a big potato field, hay fields. Um, and there was three homes, three trailer homes on that farmstead. So family, it was a big family. We lived in one of the trailers. Um, it was a, a big family group effort as most farms are. Um, I remember my first bee sting very vividly. I was running barefoot. I still tend to do that, running barefoot across the lawn and stepped on a bumblebee. And I was running because my mom got to the garden before me and I was a little mad that she started without me. Um, I remember the first wolf spider that I saw on our swing set. <laughs> I remember my cousin peeing on the electric fence to see what would happen. <laughs> I will never forget that. <laughs> Sorry, Travis. <laughs> um, I remember climbing into a big wooden spool um, and rolling down the hill in the pasture. And I remember hand churning butter with my grandmother from the fresh milk and the and the cream that rises to the top and churning that cream into butter in a big glass gallon jar. I'm sure I wasn't that helpful, um, but she made me believe that I was helping make food. Uh, I remember grandpa telling me to hold the chicken head steady on the stump. Well, he, well, you know what he, what he did. Um, the next place we moved, uh, was also a farm. It wasn't our family farm. Uh, my Our family moved after we had a house fire um, and my dad was working on a big, what seemed to me a huge dairy farm. It was probably like one barn full of cows in stalls on each side. But to me, it, it felt huge coming from our family farm of, of two cows. Um, I loved it there. I roamed the pastures. I climbed the trees. I back, you know what they call you back then when you're a young lady, you're a, you're a tomboy. I was always dirty. My dad always said, what could you brush your hair today? Uh, things like that. Um, this is also the place where I started experimenting with plants. And I knew nothing about plants, but I would bring home um, rose petals and I was trying to make perfume. So I had like this water and rose petal concoction. And I did leave it in my bedroom a little too long because it started to not smell good after a few days. Um, I was always tasting things. I don't know why I wasn't sick more because I was putting things in my mouth. I had no idea what they were or what they were for. Um, I was very curious and probably kind of naughty if you ask my mom. I remember what I now know as pineapple weed and foraging that, uh, mixing that with dandelion leaves and making like a little salad, um, eating honeysuckle. So that's kind of where I started my journey about, about food and plants. Uh, about the same time, I realized that we were poor. I didn't feel poor. Uh, other kids told me I was poor. 
I also realized that the commodities that our family lived on that the government gave us, every family didn't get those. Uh, I went started going to other folks house and I'm like, wow, they have like colored boxes and name brands and I had I had no idea. Um, and, but I didn't feel poor. I felt free and I felt happy. Uh, and I spent my teenage years doing teenage things. I didn't really, I thought more about boys and running track than I did about plants for a few years. Um, and then I spent my early 20s having babies and learning about adulting. So I didn't do much uh, farming or playing in the woods for a while. In my later 20s, I met my now husband, Jason, and we settled down with my two kids and his two kids. And we also helped a single dad raise his little boy. Uh, we bought a small five acre hobby farm near Amory, Wisconsin. That's where we raised all the kids. We gardened and raised pigs, uh, chickens, ducks, geese. We tried calves um, and I had milk goats for a long time. Uh, we also had a donkey and mule for a little while, which I told my husband was for a guardian, but I really just thought they were cool animals and wanted to have them on the on the farm. Um, I'm not, it turns out I'm not very good at fencing. And if you have goats, you know you need excellent, excellent fencing. But I gave it a shot. Um, I did have a neighbor one time call me and she said, Marsha, you have goats on your roof. And I was like, ha, okay, very funny. Uh, it turned out I really did have goats on the roof of our home. And they had used my husband's brand new shiny red GTO to get up there. So he, he was pretty happy with me. He helped me with the fence after that, though. So anyway, we, we raised the, the kids on that little farm. And at one time, because we both brought children into the marriage, they are very close in age. We had four teenagers in the house at the same time. Uh, it was busy and loud and chaotic. <laughs> and I was also putting myself through college at the time. So, and Jason uh, travels a lot for work. So there was... It was, it was a crazy time. So as soon as the kids were raised and I had my degree, I shot north and lived in the middle of the woods in a little one room cabin that my husband built for me and just sat out in nature and quiet uh, to kind of get over that crazy time. And that's when I really started learning more about my native culture, wild plants, and everything just being out in the woods every single day. Um, I worked for the Grand Portage Band for a number of years, and, and we lived off grid for a number of years with Jason coming up on the weekends. Um, yeah, and I just started learning from my elders and asking questions, learning from the community around up there. I joined the uh, Food Sovereignty Advisory Group um, and learned a ton, a ton from those folks. Um, it was about that time, too, that I was first diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, uh, and it was the first time I got to fire a doctor or felt like I had to fire a doctor, because uh, he told me that he would not check my A1C unless I took all these pills he wanted me to take. And I said, well, wait a minute, I can, I can research, I, I know about plant medicine, give me a chance to lose some weight, take some medicine and figure it out before I take these very harmful pills that are, are now polluting all of our waters. Um, and he said he wouldn't waste his time or the lab's time if I didn't take his pills. So uh, he, was, he was fired and I started Bear Grease Botanicals. Miigwech. And so that's kind of why Bear Grease Botanicals to me um, is more about education. I like to talk to people about the plants and the magic instead of just, here's my, here's my store, come buy my stuff. Um, so there I was, and I thought I was gonna retire up there and live in the woods forever. Um, and then on a cold night in November of 2021, I got a phone call my parents' home for the second time was burning to the ground and the EMS crews were trying to bring my dad back to the world of the living. 
Uh, he had fallen through the floor, breaking his back uh, and ribs after throwing mom out the door. He then fell through, he fell through the floor after throwing her out. And then he thankfully found his way outside where he immediately suffered a heart attack. So now here's me living my wonderful life. I'm in the middle of the woods, but now I have a call and I have to drive five hours. Five hours to get to my parents about broke me. I thought I may be living my best life, but I'm not helping my elders. And in our native culture, it is very important that we are learning from and helping our elders. So the last year and a half has been pretty crazy for us. My husband had jaw surgery and reconstruction. He had a growth, thankfully not cancerous. A uh, couple months after that, my son had a hole in his lung that had to be repaired. And so during that time as a caregiver, I forgot to turn to my plant relatives and I have now become unhealthy again. So now, we are getting, my husband and I are both getting back to healing each other so that we can be there for our children and our grandparents. One thing I wanna leave you with today is that we're on a crossroads here on earth. They're looking at other planets for us to live. It's unnecessary. We're at a major crossroads. We can keep with the ways we have become used to or we can start to change. We can't keep digging, ripping, and drilling into Mother Earth and expect her to keep us alive. We don't need to find a new planet to live on. We can change and relearn to treat all living things with respect, learn to live among, not above any species. We can treat our soil better. The soil of Mother Earth is the key to continued life for our great grandchildren and beyond. Think about no till. Think about creating diverse plantings instead of monocropping. Think about all of the carbon we can sequester by just treating our soil with greater respect. We can go back and ask Mother Earth for forgiveness and she will help and heal us so we can live here for a long time. So go forth this planting season with love in your heart, respect in your mind, and walk softly with Mother Earth. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Marsha, for those inspiring words and congratulations for being this year's change maker. Next, I'd like to welcome to the stage Sarah Foltz Jordan, Senior Poll Pollinator Conservation Specialist with Xerxes. Xerxes Society is a science based nonprofit organization that protects wildlife through conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. Xerxes also has a booth and the exhibit hall, which you must go visit if you haven't been there yet. <clears throat> and this year, Sarah's going to introduce our keynotes, uh, Anna Jones Crabtree and Doug Crabtree. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Marcia. That was lovely to hear more about your story. Um, I'm Sarah Fultz Jordan. I'm a pollinator conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. And it is really my great pleasure to introduce Doug Crabtree and Anna Joan Crabtree um, of Valikas Farms in Haver, Montana. So I'm in my 15th year of working with Xerces and I have had the opportunity to work with so many amazing farmers doing so many fantastic things. Um, but Doug and Anna really stand out um, in a lot of ways. Um, but especially their farming philosophy that is so truly centered around 
stewardship of the land that they're honored to be in relationship with. Um, and then also in their ability to farm, both farm and integrate conservation at massive scale. So they're farming, this is the biggest farm I've ever worked with. Um, they are a 12,500 acre organic farming operation. Um, they are doing dryland farming, um, growing wheat and other small grains, oilseed crops, legumes, um, cover crops. We've worked together to integrate native pollinator habitat strips across much of their operation. They also have native rangeland. Um, and I just want to point out this, this is radically different from the, the conventional wheat system that they're embedded in. Um, most of the farmers in that region are growing conventional wheat, which looks like a two-year rotation uh, where you grow wheat in the first year, and then the second year you keep the land fallow with herbicides to conserve soil moisture for that next year of growing wheat again. Um, and I'll never forget the, the first time I was visiting out there, what that looked like. And I honestly, I thought I understood monoculture systems and conventional systems. I grew up in the Midwest, but I'd never seen anything like that. So much bare ground right in the, the middle of a growing season. And I'll also never forget how different that is to what Doug and Anna are doing in the same climate with the same soils, um, just approaching the same problem in a really different, sophisticated and, and forward thinking way. Um, they're thinking about the future, not just themselves, not just year to year. Um, in addition to all of that farming work, Doug and Anna are committed to training the next, next generation of farmers. Um, giving young people the opportunity to live and work on the farm, learning large scale equipment, fixing equipment. I have to thank Anna because she's the one who taught me how to drive a tractor and really just threw me out on this tractor in a massive field. It was terrifying and empowering. Um, and also Doug and Anna make so much time for engagement with the organic farming community and all of the organizations that we're involved with doing great things. Um, I've got a long list of affiliations and achievements here, so brace yourself, but Doug was a founding member of the Montana Organic Association. He serves on the board of the Organic Trade Association, is a former board member of the Organic Farming Research Foundation and he manages crop contracts for the Montana Organic Producers Cooperative. Anna is a Danella Meadows Leadership Fellow and a recipient of the White House Greening Government Sustainability Hero Award. She holds a PhD in civil and environmental engineering with a minor in sustainable systems. She also serves on the Economic Advisory Board of the Biodynamic Association and on Xerxes' own advisory committee for our Be Better Certified program. Doug and Anna were one of the first farmers to get certified under that program. Um, and their keynote today is called Diversity in All Things. Um, they will share their efforts to build a resilient farm organic a resilient farm organism, striving to model radical stewardship at significant scale and their aspirations to reimagine an economy based on abundance, care, and reciprocity. So I'm so excited to hear this talk. Thank you all for welcoming, joining me and welcoming Doug and Anna. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, I guess we're on now. Thanks, Derek. We got the mics ready. <laughs> oh, wow. So humbling to be here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, quite an honor to be among our community. And that's what we really feel like we're part of you. And thank you for inviting us to share. Um, I would say there are some prime seats up front. If anyone way back there is looking for a better space. And I, uh, I also would like to invite you all, 
if, if you have conversations you need to have, I think there's great space out there and the other side of the door is to have them. Um, but we would appreciate your attention and uh, bringing those conversations to a close because I don't want to have to yell any louder than I am. <laughs> All right. So um, our story, we, uh, I, I was born with a farming disease and, uh, but we followed some other paths for a while and became beginning farmers at the age of 40 when we, uh, we bought a couple sections of land in North Central Montana. Um, so we have, we have been through that stage. We know about the, uh, the FSA and the beginning farmer loans and are grateful for those that helped get us started. Um, largely because of that, we make efforts that we'll talk a little bit more about later to uh, support, encourage, and uh, incubate uh, new farmers through our operation. We attempted to farm soon after Doug and I met at Purdue, and the joke is, is he had left engineering to go back into agriculture, so we had to find an engineer to help fund the farm. Indeed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we uh, looked at several places across the Midwest. We attempted to work with uh, older retiring generations and found that that was really a, a challenge. Um, I had a job already that was providing health insurance and there was kind of this insular idea of like, well, just move to the middle of nowhere in the Midwest and start farming. So it took us a while to find the right network, the right place, amass the right amount of resources. We had no debt other than our house when we started this at 40. Um, and there's lots more stories I could tell you about sitting in the first main um, little office of a pretty big farm financing company. And they talked to us and said, oh, sure, let's look at this. This is super exciting. New people wanna go into agriculture in Montana. And then they're like, what the heck are you doing? You're in the middle of nowhere. You didn't grow up here. And 45 minutes into the conversation, they finally look at me and say, oh, so do you work? <laughs> and I said under my breath, you can call me Dr. Jones Crabtree from then on. <laughs> so we started this wild, hairy experiment <laughs> 14 seasons ago. And to see, you know, we were younger, much younger. I think I'm starting gray. Doug's got some. I'm wearing it. <laughs> uh, and we had some hypotheses when we started. Um, it's great to be young and unaware of some of the things you don't know and all of the things that you think you do. So here are our hypotheses. Yeah, we, we assumed from all that we had heard and learned that land was going to be the biggest challenge, land scarcity and cost and, and being able to pull that together. We, we had perhaps a naive assumption that uh, practicing a, a nature-based system, a diverse crop rotation would allow the farm to thrive. That, this is still the hardest one for me to get over, but if we build something and offer opportunity, lots of folks would come and join us in the effort. And what we wanna focus on a lot today is if we did the land, the ecology and the people right, the, the farm would be economically secure. And so those, uh, the totes there of our first lentil harvest those many years ago represent some of the, the uh, hypotheses that we started with. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is tell you a little bit about our story around each one of these four areas and hope that you end up feeling empowered to tell your own story about your farms. Uh, another member of our team that's vitally important to us is Paul Neubauer. He uh, joined us in 2018. Paul grew up in Buffalo, New York, not on a farm operation. Uh, loved farming at the farm, uh, the college farm he was at, Warren Wilson, um, did some apprenticeships, and then has come to be with us long term, which is so exciting. Um, we supported him in launching a grazing enterprise in 2020, and this is why we're able to now have grazers on the farm. And Paul's not with us here today. He, he would be, but he was invited to speak to the USDA Ag Outlet Forum in Washington, D.C. Um, two days ago. Um, super articulate young gentleman um, jumped in and is now the president of our Montana Farmers Union 
um, local, and it's kind of funny because there's a lot of older folks in our local, so Paul uh, lovingly refers to them as his octogenarians. <laughs> He's also uh, taken a huge leadership role in a uh, meat processing cooperative that's recently been stood up in Haver, Montana. Super unique in the state and um, very excited about that. So um, I, I wouldn't, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about some of our other team members. I think we've hosted, I don't know, 16 apprentices over the years, eight months uh, in apprenticeships on our operation. Several of them are here at Marble Seed, so if you run into them, um, have a conversation. Uh, we've also had an innumerable number of interns and too many farm campers to count, and we're um, pretty happy about every single one of these individuals. While, while we've only had one of our apprentices actually stay, several have come back for a second season. Um, and, but they're all now off in other places doing amazing work. Shauna in the upper right-hand corner, I'm so proud of her. She had never been on a farm, came to, um, and she's like this this tall, and she uh, <laughs> learned how to drive swathers and run the fuel truck. And then she went on and did a couple other uh, grazing enterprises experiences. And then she decided to go to Yale School of Divinity. So I don't know what that says about her <laughs> agricultural experience. But she's now in downtown Kansas City as a chaplain, um, working with people on how to reconnect to land. So all that said, you can't run an operation without people and critters and patients. And we like to have a lot of fun. A lot of food. Eat well. <laughs> these, these are just some of our weekly farm team dinners. And we're so thankful to work with a local young chef whose family is organic and Sarah's down there in the lower left-hand corner. She always gives us a food story and comes up and cooks. So that's an important part of our, our culture is we're trying to create community where we are. We're in a place where there's less than five people per square mile. So this map, the, the red star there shows the approximate location of, of our farm. We are in North Central Hill County, Montana, North Central part of the state, right against the Canadian border. Oh, um, this is, oh, sorry, Doug. I thought I was, I was <laughs> going to take that control away from you if you keep it up. <laughs> um, this is the plot map of the Northern part of Hill County. So you can see where the farm itself lays, uh, where footprint is 20 miles North to South and 16 miles from East to West. We have four distinct, uh, geographic units or organisms. We call them. Uh, you can see on the map there, the lavender color is our, our high line or north unit. The uh, yellow units where we live is to the west. Green units kind of in the middle. And, and the orange is where Paul lives down south. But put those together, um, it's 12,500 acres, 20 square miles that we're managing. Uh, a little bit about the area. Uh, population of Hill County overall is 16,000. Almost 10,000 of that is in the town of Haver, which is 40 miles southeast of us. We're 150 miles to Great Falls, which has the nearest airport, or 100 miles to uh, Medicine Hat, Alberta, and 1,121 miles to La Crosse. Um, as Sarah shared, the typical crop mix, most common system in our area is wheat fallow. Um, Farmland values range from $600 to $1,000 an acre for the most part. Uh, annual rainfall average is 11 inches. So that's a big challenge. And uh, one, of our, one of our neighbors told me when we first moved there, we were talking about the area and he shared with me that, that we farm where it's too dry for cattle. And it, it took me a while to understand what that means. And, uh, but legitimately that, that there is some truth in that. Well, and just to acknowledge, you know, two very different ecosystems, the Midwest and, and us, and as Doug likes to say, you just take a zero off everything. So, so 12,000 acres, it's 1,200. Good equivalent. <laughs> Um, there's a bit more about our operation, and we're going to do a little bit more about the um, crop rotation coming up, but, you know, we're not cropping every acre. We have 26% of our land in non-crop conservation, many thanks to Sarah and the Xerces programs and 
other programs where we've been able to really take advantage of that conservation integrated into the into the um, farming operation. Yeah. Um, we, we have a five and a seven year crop rotation and a, a perennial phase that we integrate into that. We grow small grains, pulses, oil seeds, and broad leaves for the most part. Um, very excited. More recently, we were, we were integrated grazing into the cropping system. So we're getting animals on the land and all the benefits that brings. We can talk a little more about. And uh, this year we'll have 3,000 acres that are completing transition into certified organic. Most of this land has either been transitioned from Kim Fallow no-till uh, operations into our diverse operation or started from a monoculture wheat grass that had been in years and years and years of CRP with no diversity. So Doug, I think I'm gonna hand this over to you because you've got this slide and the next few on the crop rotation. Okay. I, I always put in the slide when we're talking about the farm, but I, I think, how one farm starts with how you think and your philosophy. So ours is organic as a starting point. That, that's where you, you start if you're thinking about being regenerative or sustainable or whatever the word is this week. Um, but you, you can't grow food legitimately using poison. Nature is the first and best teacher. The farming is the highest and best calling. Farmers need to be land stewards and advocates, therefore, that farming must be practiced in a manner that improves the soil and its associated resources. There are no real solutions in bags or bottles or even trucks that bring, bring their solutions to your farm. You need to develop that internally. Tillage is an art, the true art of farming. And as one of my mentors, Wendell Berry, has said, the best fertilizer are the farmer's boot prints. Right. So this is a shot of our original fields that we bought through using FSA, USDA funding. Uh, we are not the first land stewards there, nor are we the last, and we have an awful lot to learn. I think the piece that I'd like to leave you with there's 18 million acres of cropland in the state of Montana and less than 1% of that is, is organic. So every single one of you also in this room who's an organic farmer needs to stand up and be really proud about what you're doing. Here's another shot a little closer. Love the new drone technology. <laughs> yeah, this, this is just a, a bird's eye view, if you will, of. Uh, you know, Sarah described our, our farm is all laid out into uh, fairly narrow crop strips. That was originally uh, uh, thinking about wind erosion, which is a real threat in our ecosystem. And then we put 20 to 30 foot, what we call conservation strips in between every strip of crops. And uh, uh, most of those we have seeded down to perennial pollinator friendly plantings. Uh, that's a close-up view of one of the strips in a, a nice year when there was lots of blooming going on, but that gives you an idea of, of what they look like. And, and then the, the patient's part of this, and this is from the tour that Sarah helped us host, is after we've seeded these and they've been in the ground, we have native plants showing up that weren't even in the original seed mix. So the work of stewardship is patience, and this is just so fun and exciting, and um, I'm excited to see what happens in another 14 years. So I'll talk about the, the primary crop rotation. It's a seven-year uh, alteration. You can start with what we call light grains. These are um, grains that, that use less water and less fertility. Examples we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Uh, then we have a, a green fallow year where we incorporate uh, at bloom uh, vetch, peas, or clover. Uh, we can also graze that now that we're bringing more cattle. Uh, then we grow the, the heavy grain, which is modern wheat, either spring or winter. Follow that with a, a grazing year. If we can get the, get the animals, if not, we might grow oats or a broadleaf crop. It's basically a scavenger crop there, uh, which we use in place of a fallow year. And then a uh, uh, most commonly a harvested pulse, but depending on 
on the conditions and the soil and the moisture, we could also do a, a fallow pulse there, which again would be either grazed or, or turned in as green manure. And then a, uh, uh, these co categories have gotten broader as I've, I've learned over the years that we need to be more flexible, but this is basically the, the six years, this makeup year where anything we haven't done before and we, we work really hard to get oats into the rotation. So if we haven't gotten them in up to this point, we'll, we'll definitely grow oats there, but also uh, various broadleaf crops. And then we end up uh, with either a fallow or a harvested pulse again, and then restart. So we're gonna look at some pictures of some of these crops. Yeah, so it's a, li a little crazy making. Our apprentices, we all have a map book that we give everybody and everybody always is like, why is this all complex? And so every year Doug has this all in his head, but the rest of the team team does not. Uh, bit of a microphone difficulty. Uh, so that's a, a picture of spelt, one of the light grains that we grow, fall seeded primarily, although we're trying to spring spelt this year. Uh, that's a, um, a hopeless barley. And that's Anna standing in a field of rye. It's one of our favorite crops. <laughs> the halcyon days. <laughs> uh, and our, our green manure, our favorite one, most common is chickling vetch that we usually intercede with oats. And then when you terminate it with a blade plow, you get something that looks like that, a mulch for the rest of the season. Uh, the heavy grain, that's pretty common, is uh, red wheat, either winter or spring. And then our, our next is a, a grazing mix. And that could also be a, uh, an oat, usually interseeded with sweet clover, or flax is one of the broadleaf options that we can put in this position. I'll follow that with a either a harvested or a fallow pulse. This is a field of, of yellow peas in bloom, the sweet grass hills in the background. Um, there's lentils that Rusty was uh, helping us scout. Then we go to that uh, sort of makeup phase of the rotation. This is a Khorasan wheat or Kamut interseeded with flax. As oats with an underseed of sweet clover. And that's a safflower crop. Um, at the end of uh, the third cycle of every rotation, roughly, we enter into a perennial phase where we'll seed alfalfa or sandfoin under a, a grain crop, usually oats. Um, We'll leave that stand or graze it for three or four years uh, with no tillage, no, no haying or harvest. We use that to really enhance the soil building, uh, get ahead of some perennial weeds that may crop up and just generally allow the soil to rest. So then as now, you can have a great plan and things always don't go as planned, but once it does, it does rain and you can get stuck in the tractor, <laughs> which is, we would love to have this happen again. So this is our last two years. Last year was devastating. 9% of our average production. The year before we had 37% of average production. The picture in the upper right hand corner is what things looked like in early June. We were hosting a farm tour. We were so excited. Doug was driving around doing crop scouting. We had busted our butts when our team was amazing and we got everything in in a timely fashion. Because when you're in an ecosystem like ours, it's all about moisture management and going when you gotta go. When nature says go, you figure it out. Things were so green. Doug's like, man, I'm rating crops as eights. <laughs> I never rate crops as eights because he has this little scouting form and we go around and look at things. It was so, it was, it was glorious. By the end of June, early July, it was 50 mile an hour winds and a hundred degrees. For, and a if you're, at a for a week at a time. And if you're a lentil, I kind of want to go on an interpretive dance here. Like everybody imagine you're a lentil and you're, and you're like, all you want to do is pod, right? You're like trying to bloom and you're trying to pod and you absolutely cannot do it under those conditions. And many of you have all seen rising interest rates, all these other things that are happening are around farms. Did you want to? Yeah, just the, the picture at the bottom corner, that's last summer, and that looks bad enough, but, but I want to point out that 
that was a crop strip. But those were supposed to be green crops, and that's what was left by July. And uh, we were grazing the, uh, you know, what what there was of the crop. We were grazing it, and that's what it looks like when you've got seventy five cattle running on a fifty acre strip of not much. But aren't we lucky? We had something that came up. We had cows that were able to actually eat something, and then we moved them on. So part of our story is diversity helps to create resilience. We've also been told that systems like ours are just too complex to model. So I'll get into the ecosystem service thing, thing later. But, but what, what is that? Nature works on complexity. Nature works on diversity. I get that we don't fit into a model, but how come we always get to carry the risk of holding a different system? So I was thinking about our farm and these outside forces and what each farm that I know does. Each farm that I know is a heart. They're like a beating heart. They're like a sunshine. They're like a ray of sun. All of us as organic farmers, we're doing things that go outside of our farm organism. We do everything we can to keep our farm organism healthy and happy. And that from that comes food and education and habitat, diversity, healthy soil, healthy people. But there's these other forces that sometimes are really overwhelming in terms of your farm system. And my friend Beth, who's a biodynamic farmer in Oregon, I love this quote. She says, as much as I work on the farm, it works on me. So I think about my friend Stefan Schneider, uh, Hawthorne Valley. It's not just about soil, it's your inner soil and it's the community soil. So carry this in your mind. Oops, whoa, whoa. sorry. What happened? Oh, so here we are back to our thesis. Thesis. Okay. <laughs> so our first question was Is it possible to start and, and grow an organic farm from scratch? And we're still there, so it is. Um, not without cost. You can see a, a younger, darker haired version of me there, uh, hard at work. And then what happens when I try to work now? <laughs> um, <laughs> The cedar's grown, the combine's grown, the house has improved a bit, and uh, we're still there. Yeah, the house in the bottom middle. Uh, so when we started farming, this is, you know, FSA was so great. Like We were so lucky to have Dick Nicholson, who was our loan officer, who actually was an organic farmer up on the high line of Montana. So we went to do our loan. Um, we didn't have bins. We didn't even have any equipment. <laughs> We were going to start from nothing, and we were both working full-time in Helena, Montana, a four-and-a-half-hour drive away. Well, none of that mattered, but we didn't have a house is what they were worried about because we had intended to farm on the weekends because it wasn't that many acres. It was 1,280 acres we were buying off the open market. Um, so luckily, the person that we bought the farm the land from had a house that he rented to us that hadn't been lived in for over I think six years or so. So we were lucky to have so that we, come to be. We moved some of the mice out and lived there on weekends for a few yeah. years. But the point is, is you can do it. It takes a community of help organizations and people. Um, so many thank yous to so many people. We would not be able to be telling the story if there hadn't have been all of the great advocacy work, the help, the people to call and ask, how do you navigate things? You have to have your own tenacity, but it takes a community outside. And it also takes a lot of people to show up and just help. Like uh, on the right hand, upper right, that's like Doug's dad and Uncle Sam. It's nothing like three small, slow talking crab trees. <laughs> <laughs> every day <laughs> so many friends and family have have come and been part of our journey and and really couldn't have done it without all of them yeah and what's fun is the two young uh women standing on the combine came to farm camp with their parents friends from helena and they're uh both now in college and melina on the rights graduated with a nursing degree 
So here's a little after action review. Since I'm a scientist, a PhD, I have to think about you know, things over the long run, what's happened. So we, the next series of slides is really about our experience around our other four hypotheses. So land, Doug, take it away. So land, um, as I said, we, we assumed, at least I did, that that was going to be the biggest challenge. How do you find, attract, retain land and enough land to make a viable uh, economically scaled dry land farm. Uh, you know, as we, we knew, two sections in that part of the world is, is half a farm, maybe at best. We were going to need to add to that, and we had no idea how we'd be able to. Uh, what we have experienced is that is by far the least of our problems, that we have found um, this whole new class of folks, including our, our great friends at Iroquois Valley, um, that invest in land with the express purpose of, of bringing it to organic farmers uh, with long tenured leases and, and financing. And there are others in that space, but, but they were the pioneers and very helpful to us. We've had local landowners that, that have seen what we do and, and value it. You know, the, you know not, not all, but uh, there, there are contrarians in the community as well. Um, and we've had a few people call us from Boston and say, my mother has land on the High Line. Do you want to farm it? Do you know somebody else with, uh, who would be an organic farmer? So that's been a real privilege also to have people who have left Montana, left with a story of agriculture and really and then have an understanding of what's going on in the larger world, um, come back and want to take care of their, their land. So looking ahead, where we've been, um, our institute is the a founding member of the Montana Agrarian Commons. We don't have a project yet, but we're working on that. And we're really working on developing more equitable share leases with our seven landowners. So diversity again in, in landowners. Um. On the other hand, I, I guess I am equally disappointed in our ability to attract and retain people. Um, as I said at the outset, we assumed based on our own experience and, and hearing at groups like this that there's a whole population of persons, perhaps a generation, that is looking for opportunities to farm. Uh, we have worked really hard to offer such opportunities, and we are underwhelmed by the response. Well, and we totally understand that our place is pretty unique. It's a 40-mile drive to the grocery store, and that's not for everybody. Um, but we also see this really interesting dynamic tension um, between what we've experienced and heard from many of our apprentices about what they want and are seeking in life versus what agriculture is as we now practice it or need to practice it because of the forces external to us. So how do we close that gap is one of the questions that is remaining for us. There's also a really deep, uh, thanks, deep narrative around don't be a farmer. Our, our apprentices have told us this. Um, they, their friends and family have been like, what are you doing on a farm? That's, you know, which is really sad in a way, but they can learn and then go be advocates for what needs to actually happen with agriculture. So we're looking at new business structures moving forward. How do we iterate the one that we're under now and allow some more cooperative collaborations um, or equity building for the next generation? Um, to come in. We're building other enterprises. We'll tell you a little bit about that. And, you know, this year we didn't have any apprentice applicants. So we have turned to uh, H2A labor and we're bringing in three South Africans. Uh, so I'm excited to learn a lot about their culture and where they're from. But there are some real labor challenges on not just our farm, but across many farms. Um, and we're starting an artist in residence program because we feel like much to what Sarah said, you can't unsee once you see what is happening in the Northern Great Plains. So just one other people part. Oh, did you want to say no, something? Right I'm sorry, Doug. Right <laughs> one other people part. Uh, last week, to me, a very sad thing happened. This was the Cottonwood meeting hall where many of those Cottonwood 
farmers union local members have memories of their mother playing piano in this meeting hall. The meeting hall was burned down last week because it was too much of a liability for our small volunteer fire department or so that was the choice. I just offer this picture in that people had community. There was a sense of getting together and how do we build that again? And maybe it's not all in your local location. Maybe it's all of us as a community. This is a fun picture. This was the halcyon days after the, the day, right after the farm tour. <laughs> so we were, we were all happy. Um, in, in ecology, uh, our thesis was that integrating a, a diverse crop rotation would form the basis for a, a thriving farm. Uh, we had a, a limited view on diversity going in. We thought, you know, if we grow six or eight crops when the normal is one, we've, you know, uh, exponentially expanded diversity. Over the years, we, we learned to appreciate the diversity in the native uh, areas that surround us. We've brought in the pollinator habitat, reseeded native strips. So we, we added some diversity in and around the farm. Um, more recently, we're, we're finding that we need to be diverse in people and enterprises and livestock and bring more animals onto the land as well as crops, bring more value added and complementary enterprises to the farm to make it hopefully a more resilient organism. We're looking for a sheep human, if any of you know one. So one of the next projects that we're super excited about is this idea around snow capture. So often you have snow fence that keeps thing, snow from blowing onto the road. We're gonna do the opposite and we're gonna put snow fence around all of our dugouts, which are places that water collects for cattle. Um, this is a picture in our windbreak just this year, um, uh, probably a month ago of the snow catch in our windbreak. And this is another picture several years ago of one of those pollinator strips. So you can literally see when you drive down that side of the strip with the combine, the yield difference. Um, you wanna say anything to that, Doug? Well, and we're very excited about the potential to you know, our, our conservation strips now have a grass forb mix that's maybe in a good year knee high. If we can seed those to these uh, shrubs, uh, carragana and other species, but, but that's the primary one that can get 20 feet high, we can then collect several times the amount of snow, have several times the amount of, of added moisture across the crop strip for the following year. And we've really seen it. We have three fields that have old previously established shrub rows and they have had noticeably improved uh, superior production during these two horrible, uh, you know, really excessive droughts we've had the last two years. So we're really fired up about getting some more help from Xerces and, and uh, NRCS and others to, uh, the goal is to seed 300 miles of shrub rows across the farm. So we're looking for a Forester, a plains forester. <laughs> We're going to start with two miles next year. We'll start with two miles. We're going to put some snow fence up. So if any volunteers want to come help put snow fence up this year to catch snow to create the microclimate for uh, planting the seedlings in 24, that'd be great. But the fun thing about ecology is it stacks benefits. Right, you start with one thing like, oh, we've got to deal with the wind erosion because we're in a place with light soils. Oh, let's do these strip things. Oh, wow. Then you see a presentation for Eric Mater by Xerces. Like, oh, what if we started seeding pollinator habitat in there? Well, now we're realizing all these amazing benefits that we didn't actually plan originally. Native bees and beneficials, everything so, come. So the question is, is how do you think about being on the edge? Like, I think there's an ecological principle where edges are super cool places, right? Like a lot of really fascinating stuff happens on the edge. So as a farm, we're on the edge of Canada. We're on the edge of the Northern uh, Great Plains tri Golden Triangle, right? We're on the edge of, can you actually do agriculture with 11 inches or five inches of moisture a year? But look, there's a lentil plant. Doug's holding a lentil plant. What happens on the edges of those roots? I don't know how many of you have dogs. This is the last generation of Jack Russell Terriers and a Basset Hound farm camper, but uh, the, the edge right there is always good and edges on cake, right? 
Um, so the, what system signals are um, emerging uh, from the edge that we, we have? And it can be kind of scary, but, you know, so we started the farm and we said, let's, let's do this thing. And we kind of were in a state of reverie, right? Like, well, we can do it. No one's gonna tell us not to do it. And so I love this poem with some pictures. I think Sarah is actually in there. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where the challenge comes in. We can keep doing all the amazing ecology, but the economics are something that I think all of us need to take some more time to be transparent and tell the story of what's happening on your farm. So our our uh, hypothesis on economics was um, naive, I guess, that if we did the right thing by the land, we learned and in incorporated some principles of ecology, treated people right, that the farm would be economically secure. Yeah, that's probably an oversimplification, but, but that's the gist of it. We thought a nature-based farming system would be productive, that the organic market would support you know, the added premiums, if you will, from selling organic crops would be more than adequate to support a, a thriving farm. And uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm disappointed to say that has not been true. We have found that diversity alone cannot overcome the, uh, the economics imposed. You remember that, that chart with the sun, the imposed from the outside. So stewardship, is just not compensated for in our current economy. Um, the subsidies that are available, particularly through crop insurance, are very rigged to support commodity crops uh, and either discourage or not support at all the, uh, the diverse systems that you need to be ecologically sustainable. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to, to be as efficient as possible to hone and, and keep our expenses under tight control. Uh, comes the realization we don't have an expense problem. Yeah. You know. So, so you know, some of the things we're thinking about moving forward is we're making some choices to grow more wheat this year. That's something we totally can get crop insurance for. And we have a few other exciting things that we're trying to think about uh, and bring to bear. And we'd love your help as a community in doing that. But part of the transparency here is here's our income and expenses from 2018 to 22. I'm still working an off-farm job. Doug is not taking a salary. How 80% of farms, according to USDA statistics, have someone working an off-farm job. We know all of the date, all the data about on-farm income. So we have looked at our profit and loss, we've carved, we've tried to be creative, but this is the stark reality. Now, maybe it's a little worse for us since we've just had two years of drought. And the other thing to keep in mind here is 2022 looks pretty good, right? Well, we at least did enough to live to see another year, but we haven't seen 23 yet. So there's this lag, right? Our buyers don't necessarily take any crops until early the next year. So you don't get paid on the next year. So, because it's this long-term thing, it's not a quarterly profit reporting cycle thing, agriculture is. Um, so when you don't have any crops in the bin, what's 23 gonna look like? Yeah. So this is a, a copied out of a, a letter we got this year. We did some, uh, to get through last year, which was recovering from a drought, we did some, it's called vendor financing where one of our suppliers offered a financing for seed and um, Midway through the year, with the economy things going on, they wrote us this note that you know the um, prime rate went up, so your interest rate will be going up. And we uh, they, they said so, uh, to have our finance department connect them. So this is our finance department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I turned around as we got several letters like this. So I turned around. And I thought, hmm, hello, Mother Nature. Gosh, we're super like, who do I write a letter to? Who do I write a letter to, right? Like, can I pass along that fuel surcharge? So, so like, I'm super thankful to service the habitat for your pollinators and your soil microbes, but, you know, interest rates have gone up. 
I need to do something different. Um, you know, so we're gonna have to make other choices. And, you know, if you have any questions or concerns, call the farm accounting department. Like who is that, right? I don't have an 800 number. Well, and in all seriousness, uh, we had planned with the 3000 acres that are coming into organic this year to seed another 300 acres of um, pollinator habitat in conservation strips. And um, one reason that I think is, is reasonable it was just too dry to do that and I, I don't think it's safe yet even if we have a good winter to think we're going to establish new native habitat but also we simply can't afford the seed you know that's a 10 probably a forty thousand dollar investment and uh you know we're so, looking for help for it but we're just going to put it off for a year that's yeah one of the difficult decisions we've had to make so i'm sure all of you make these day-to-day -day decisions about what can you actually do in your operation versus what you want to do and i'm going to speed us up a bit here doug given our time is you know this hazel henderson uh economics died this last year i believe but take a look at this economic model so there's a whole body of knowledge around ecological economics. We all know as farmers, nothing else happens on this planet unless you work with mother nature. And yet what are we doing in our economic system? Our economic system focuses on that top layer. It focuses on cash transactions, the transactions, not relationships. What's the bottom layer? The layer that is its severe um, challenge with climate change, that's mother nature. We've got to start thinking differently and talking differently about this bottom layer of our economic cake because it's all, it's all very shaky right now. So that's led me to think about Robin Wall Kimmerer, oh, an amazing book. What about a gift economy? How about we have relationships? We as farmers are asked to have relationships with our land every day. We're asked to have relationships with the community, but yet how is that happening in the rest of the supply chain? We can't ask for fundamental change at a farm production level if we're not gonna ask for fundamental change of the forces that tell us to do the way that, act the way that we are now. How do you have we rather than I? I love this picture, like look at their horns, right? They're gonna figure out how to lift their heads and not ram into each other. Plus Highlanders, how can you not love them? So I got to take a class from the Demeter um, Biodynamic Federation out of Switzerland, had to get up at like five o'clock. This was last, last fall. But uh, you know, think about this. They talk about a social economy or a social economics. So the cosmos is the farm. We're the ones that do the work and bring in value from nature. And the table is your wholesaler, retailer, uh, processor. How do we all sit at a table and have an association where we're sharing? We don't have to be best buddies, but we need to share. Here's a few things that we're doing now around how do we share or ask for sharing of risk with some of our buyers. We, well, first of all, we contract everything we grow. So we seek production contracts before we ever buy seed. And in many cases, we, we negotiate with the buyer to either provide or provide the cost for that seed. We sell acres, not bushels. So they get what there is. Um, we negotiate revenue floors. So if you want us to grow a specialty crop, sure, we'll do that. Guarantee is $100 an acre so that we can at least cover costs. Um, so, yeah. so our point with this is what do all of you need on your operation to thrive? And are you finding your voice to ask for that in the arrangements that you're making? Uh, we've had several lucky opportunities to work with individuals around unique financing um, arrangements, you know, for example, these fuel tanks, we were buying fuel, fuel not in bulk. If we bought it in bulk, it was 30 to 50 cents a gallon savings. We had an investor help pay to build fuel tanks. And guess what? We make that payment based on the difference between the bulk and how much we bought versus what the non-bulk price is. That's our payment and huge help to the farm. Uh, we're also doing some value-added direct marketing with rye. So these are these are the folks at Glacier Distilling, and 
Doug likes to make a joke that, you know, after a year of 9% production, you know, rise a pretty fun thing to smile about. <laughs> the only thing that keeps you smiling. 2024, so you can all take the train to Glacier National Park and we can have a party. So my point around all this, our point around all this is that stewardship happens no matter how little it rains or how much it rains. So we've also started a program called our CSSA, Community Supported Stewardship Agriculture. For $100, you can buy one share in the service of stewardship. So think about, wow, well, that's kind of weird. What is that? Well, how many of you people, how many of you think about buying carbon credits? And where do those go? I, I feel like we have this idea of, of setting up these carbon markets and the ecosystem service markets when really maybe we just need to pay the people who are doing the work directly and form a direct relationship. Well, and and the real dream of this is that at $100 an acre, we would no longer have to borrow operating capital. So if, if we can sell enough of these shares or this type of uh, funding mechanism, we can replace uh, capital and, and sort of be free of that limitation. So it was super fun in the workshop today. A couple other examples came up of this kind of idea. So I would love to hear more of those. Take this, steal this. I have some cards about our CSSA and we'd love to have more subscribers. Um, you can get the artist in residence unique special release each year if you become a subscriber. So my point is we don't have time to wait to measure carbon, right? We're talking a lot about carbon. Um, we started an institute to say, how, and I didn't really want to do this. Why do we need another nonprofit? Do we need another entity to manage? But I felt like it was really important to bring some philanthropic dollars so that Doug and I could start better sharing our story because we don't have time to stand and wait till carbon markets and the economics work better for farmers. We need to share the learning that we've, we've had the privilege of doing the last 14 seasons. So this, this uh, was another um, interesting article that I heard. Do you, have any of you seen this from the UN State of Finance for Nature? It basically says we have to more than double what we're spending on nature-based solutions. What's more of a nature-based solution than organic agriculture? Doing it in a way that's super biodiverse, that cares about people and critters and soil. Yeah, and the, the background we chose for this was intentional. Uh, that's a picture of something called Virga, if any of you are familiar with that, but it's, it's rain that doesn't hit the ground. And we get a lot of that in our country. And we feel like that's a good analogy for the, uh, uh, you know, what's happening with climate and, and uh, ecosystem services is that rain's not hitting the ground of farms. Yeah, so how do we help it rain? Lots of money into regenerative finance, lots of money into regenerative stuff. But what other conditions do we need to create so that we can have new land stewards actually start? Because there's less than 1% of us in the US that are actually trying to make a living from production agriculture. So think about that for a minute. That's 1%, that's us, that's our chemical fallow no-till neighbors, that's all of you. Organic is 1% of the 1%. We have to have openings for new entrants. So here's, here's a quick uh, story. And then I know Allie's given me the hook. We're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. But this is, a real, this is probably the most important tool that we have had on our farm. That's all about the equipment. But. This is our vision board. So um, it's just kind of a, a messy place that we, when we find ideas or draw pictures of things that we're inspired by or that we hope to um, hope to add to the to the organism. So we walk by this every day. It's in our kitchen. We actually started one of these before we started our farm. And I remember I was cutting out pictures of birds and habitat and good housing and Doug's cutting out pictures of equipment. So this was back in like 2008, right? So here's what happened. So uh... Yeah, you know, I, I had a dream of a caterpillar tractor. That to me was the ultimate, most awesome thing. You know, a track machine, be good on the soil and all that. But, and um, the, the gentleman we bought the land from, he had retired from farming. I didn't even know this, but when we were, showed up to sign some papers, this tractor was in his barn. 
and I covered said, in owl crap. <laughs> yeah, he had he had not used it for three or four years at least, and um, I said, "What's the story with that tractor?" And he, well, I haven't got around to selling it. Don't know what I want to do. So we were able to rent that tractor, and then after a year, we bought it from him. Um, but you know, it was more than I could even have imagined that possibility when we were talking to FSA and they were telling us how little we had to spend on the equipment. But. A pretty powerful thing. So yeah, and a, a little creepy in some ways, right? But like that tractor was the exact model that Doug had cut out and put on the vision board. Same with Highlander cows, same with this red farm truck, same with the uh, Klaus combine. So we now have new things on our vision board. And I want to share this. I hope you guys all go out and cut your own vision board. I wrote a check. I wrote a check to Velikas Enterprises from the Bank of the Universe saying, oh, what would I want? Two and a half million dollars. And it's signed, uh, your ancestors old and new, because I really want to learn from them. I want some help and support, and I want to pay that support forward. The other thing on our vision board is Canada. I love working with the Canadians. Um, they actually, the Farmers Union in Canada wrote this report, Imagine If, a vision of a near zero emission farm and food system. Look this up, read it, talk about it with your people. It is, it is really forward thinking. Think if a national farm organization in this country would put in print the idea of nitrogen fertilizer free agriculture. So. The, the power of a vision is you put it out there, but you never really know how it's going to happen. So you have to be connected to kind of the end thing and not connected to the implementation. And my ideas of vision were hugely informed by my Don Meadows Sustainability Fellows Leadership Program. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? Um, If you get a chance to read anything by Donella Meadows, do it. She was a systems thinker. She helped develop the book Limits to Growth in the 70s. She was told when she wrote that book that, that is, that's, that's just obnoxious, right? Like we're all gonna die. The planet's gonna go to heck. She said, no, 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 no. What I did is I talked about what our pathways are if we make these choices today, here are how things will play, could play out or will likely play out. So what I asked of all of you is we have choices today, right now to do things differently. Let's face it, the universe is messy. We're not gonna put everything into a spreadsheet. I'm an engineer and I'm saying this, right? Like <laughs> we're not, it self-organizes, it evolves. It creates diversity, not uniformity. And that's what makes it interesting. And that's what's beautiful. And that's what makes it work. Thank you very much. Is that the last one? Oh. Well, we'll just leave you with one other picture. You want to talk we'd, about this, Doug? We'd be glad to take questions if we have time. And the picture is actually our one pond, and these are two pelicans that showed up on our pond in the middle of the middle of the plains. Isn't that incredible? All right, and yeah, I'm sorry about the time, but we're good. All right, we can take a few questions. Go ahead, Doug. I don't know if I can see far enough, but I, I see there's one. Some microphones, but I can't really see you. So maybe Allie could help us here. There's a microphone way back there and one over here. Thank you all for your attention. You're done. Thank you. If, if you, I can try to repeat the question if that's easier. The 
Question is, what is the average sized farm in our area? What is the average sized organic farm? And what was the third part? Why have we scaled to the, um, okay. I think according to the ag census, uh, the average size farm in Hill County is 6,000 some odd acres. Uh, of course, as you know, ag census includes a lot of non-commercial farms. Uh, it's not uncommon for some of our neighbors to farm 20, 30,000 acres. Um, organic farms are much smaller by nature. I would say, and this is only a guess on my part, that the average organic farm in Montana, at least the, the dry land part is two to 3,000 acres. Um, and I would say it's because I'm insane, but uh, I have trouble when offered the chance to bring more land under better stewardship. I don't know how to do this. I only know how to do this and we'll find a way. <laughs> All right. Oh, one more in the hand up. Yeah, go ahead. We'll repeat it. So, so the question was around uh, some earlier research from Kansas researchers from Rutgers talking about Buffalo Commons in Kansas. So, um, I don't know. Yeah. So encompass the whole Great Plains area about re, re, re bringing the buffalo back. Check out the American Prairie Foundation in Western or Eastern Montana. They're doing some of that work. All right, I think yeah, and Doug and I are around the rest of the day. If any of you have questions, thank you very much. Let me, oh, one more. Charlie, that's Charlie. Good. That's my question. If who was? Um, so repeat the question. Yeah, he asked if Governor Dunstan, I'm sorry, I don't know this person, but <laughs> was to come to the farm, what would I say to him? I'd say, welcome, and thank you for coming, and look around. Um, we, we love to have others show up, and we try to show what nature is showing us. Um, I think that's the best tool we have to show logic and to show humility is to open up. And, and I think the more of us that can open our farms to folks that don't share our, our views yet, uh, we can show them nature's wisdom. All right. Thank you. Uh, so just in a quick word of wrap up again congratulations to Marsha huge thanks to Doug and Anna uh, one of my favorite quotes is be in the world the way you want the world to be and they demonstrate that every single day um, thank you all uh, for joining us this year for our 31st 34th annual conference. It was great to see everybody's faces and feel the energy in this building. Uh, we hope to see you over the course of this next year at field days, at other events. We do more than this conference, but then definitely see you again next year. Right now, one of the things that is happening new this year is the farmer convergence, the ultimate networking of networking, and that is happening up in that Riverview new area, North Hall. So 
make your way over there and everyone safe journey home. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>